Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the Analytic Mind podcast. Uh, another great um, podcast session um, coming up right now. I'm joined by Tim Freestone from Aluba, which is a really interesting um, platform or online platform for uh, data uh, analysis professionals and data science professionals. So I'm really looking forward um, to diving into this uh, topic and, and content with um, Tim today. Um, Tim, why don't, why don't I just quickly throw to you, you can do a much better background um, um, regarding yourself and, and how you've um, come to be here to, uh, you know, with the Louvre and, and how you create it because you're the founder, obviously. So um, give us a bit of background on that and um, yeah, we can just kick into our discussion after. Awesome. Yeah, well, thanks uh, for having me, Sam. It's great to be here. Uh, yeah, so Loop is a business I founded about three years ago. Um, prior to that, I was managing an analytics team at a tech company. And I had, I think, two big pain points in my life there. So one was anytime we went to hire someone in analytics, let's say a data analyst, data engineer, data scientist, someone like that, I found it to be a massive pain in the ass, frankly. <laughs> you know, you put up the job ads, you get at that point, hundreds of applications, you have to kind of sift through all these CVs and try to think like, oh, is this the right candidate for me based on the CV? It's very hard. Yeah. And I spent a lot of time in phone screens and those kind of initial interviews assessing candidate skills very, very slowly and inefficiently. And I found a lot of candidates who maybe thought they had amazing skills on paper, once I got five or 10 minutes into the conversation, realized they didn't really have the skills that they thought they had. So that was the, the first problem I was trying to solve. The other one was um, we had maybe five or six analysts in our company out of maybe 150 people. Uh, but when I looked around at what all the product managers were doing, the supplier managers, all the marketers, even senior execs, when I looked at what they actually did day to day, I'd say at least half of it was what I would call analytics. It wasn't advanced data science, but it was at least you know, digging into trends, understanding the metrics, running reports doing a bit of wrangling, a bit of cleaning, a bit of aggregation. It was basically analytics, but they didn't think of themselves as that, nor did people recruit for those roles as if they were analysts. So a great saying by one of our investors is like, you know, everyone's a data analyst, but only some of us call ourselves that, right? And I think that's the way the world's going. So fast forward to today, basically, we help businesses assess the skills of their analytics and data science candidates um, in a kind of fair and objective way. And we also help businesses understand their data literacy internally across their teams and people. Mm. Well, that's great. And, and it's so, it's, I, I, I kind of smile when you were talking through some of that because when I was um, working in corporate, which was a while ago now, because I started Enterprise DNA about six years ago, um, but just the inefficiencies around hiring practices, somehow it, it, is, it, it evolved to the most archaic and hopeless way that you hire people. Like, you know, you'd, you'd, every single role would have the same generic, just interviews with an HR person. And then you're assessing yeah. people based on, um, you know, just basically how, how nice they can format a, um, uh, a CV. <laughs> Uh, exactly. And and then um, the um, the amount the, the volume that you're having to deal with because of all these online platforms just makes it just unmanageable. And so um, you know I, I saw that back then, but you know um, I, I think it's almost like you've 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 realised that every niche within a business probably has you know has to have um, a certain way you know a, an optimised way to hire people. And um, and it sounds like you're really really trying to nail that. Yeah, for sure. And we've focused so far on what I guess I call the screening step of the hiring process. So like, okay, we've got 100 applicants. Who are the five or six we should interview? Um, but we're now trying to tackle the stages further down the process. So to your point there around like kind of generic HR interviews or ways of evaluating candidates that don't really make sense, um, yeah. that's really what we're trying to do away with. We're trying to make the whole hiring process as objective as possible, whether mm -hmm. that's the initial application, a quick online quiz and interview. I think it's all about making it as structured as possible and objective as possible. So when you hire someone, you know exactly what you're hiring for mm. and you measure them using the right data. Right. And um, what what makes a, a, a sort of a good candidate in your eyes? Because just, just from knowing the space you know, relatively well, I mean, there's so many technologies. There's, there's so many types of analysis that you can do. There's advanced analytics, there's data science, there's just general analytics. So like, how are you um, figuring out who's a good candidate? You know, from 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 all of those um, you know those segments. 
Yeah. So I think when we work with companies, basically, we try to help them define for themselves what they're looking for very concretely. So we don't necessarily say, okay, you should be looking for X, Y, Z in this type of candidate. It's more like, okay, you tell us what you need in terms of their technical skills, their soft skills, their whatever, and we will help them design a hiring process that actually tries to hit those goals. What we've found a lot is the hiring processes and the hiring goals are quite mismatched between companies. So you have like a JD, which has got a laundry list of every conceivable technology, and then someone who's going to do their interview and they have their interview questions that are trying to evaluate what they're looking for. And then someone in HR is doing some generic checklist. And it's just all kind of, mm. it's all higgledy right? Yeah, and right. what we try to do is encourage them just to have this very clear blueprint. Here's exactly the, I don't know, five, six, seven things we're looking for. And let's just design each step of the hiring process to evaluate those things. Um, now, if it's a technical skill, maybe you're better off evaluating that in some kind of quiz test. And if it's a softer skill, you're probably better off evaluating that in an interview. But mm-hmm. as long as you've defined that ahead of time and you've thought through exactly how you're going to do that, that's really how we help businesses. Right. And how have you um, found getting alignment between sort of the HR areas and the in-business uh, teams from you know, just my own experience? That, that's always quite difficult. So how, how, do, you, um, how, do, you, how do you actually achieve achieve that, get everyone in the same room, basically. Yeah, that's tricky. And I don't feel like we've got the perfect solution for that either. Um, so when we yeah, work with new companies, typically we work with talent acquisition and hiring managers and analytics. And in some really big businesses, they might not even talk to each other. Like it is a completely decoupled hiring approach where one person's doing one thing and another person gets a set of CVs that have been shortlisted somehow through some magic box, right? Yeah. And yeah. so... We do try to get them in the same room and get them agreed on the pain points and the problems. But, you know, they're individuals. They often have their own agendas and their own things that are going on. So generally speaking, we try to make our approach appeal to each person uh, who's involved in that process. Mm. Does, is, it, is it the same sort of thing working with outside recruiters as well as um, internal um, HR people? Because I, I presume a lot of companies still still don't you know use outside people to, to um, get candidates. Yeah, again, they probably have a slightly different approach. Um, I think recruiters and talent acquisition are a little bit different. Recruiters are more, I'd say, metric driven. It's all about, okay, like here's the sales, here's the you know closes I have to make this week, and they're all about making a deal, I would say. Talent acquisition maybe don't have that same ruthlessness or sense of urgency is my 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 sense of, of the situation. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, really, it's just about helping each of these segments solve problems. Um, if that's saving time, if that's saving money, if that's hiring a better candidate, whatever that is. Right. And where are you finding a lot of your um, customers? Like, uh, is it is it because you're obviously from Australia, but um, are you, you know, taking a more sort of global approach to your customer base? Yeah, most of our customers are overseas um, for whatever reason, not necessarily a conscious effort. So we do try to target generally Canada, US, um, Western Europe, UK, and Australia. Um, but we seem to have gotten more traction overseas. So about 90% of our customers are outside of Australia. Mm -hmm. Um, I wonder whether in Australia we're not the fastest adopters of new technologies and new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. So we've generally found that the slightly more progressive a business that we work with, the more open they are to change, Um, especially if we're trying to convince them to do things like, hey, you know, maybe you shouldn't, manually screen 500 CVs, maybe you should do something a bit more objective, a bit more scalable. Mm-hmm. That always involves some kind of change process. Um, and for whatever reason, yeah, that's been adopted more widely uh, in other countries other than Australia. Right. And and you mentioned a really interesting insight um, earlier where you said that, you know, you, you, you personally saw that more often than not, even um, people who wouldn't consider themselves analysts had a lot of data related work in their in their in their job. So how um, how integrated is your um, um, testing or or assessing uh, for those types of roles? Like, um, are you working with with companies that are saying, yeah, I want to put my manager through this data literacy assessment? Is, is that is that something that is, is is gaining quite a bit of traction? Yeah. So for the data literacy piece. Uh, we've gotten certainly more traction in understanding strengths and weaknesses internally. So from a set of people who are currently working at the company, understanding that 
And normally it's in conjunction with some kind of learning and development plan where the business recognizes, hey, this thing called data literacy is really important. So let's start by establishing a baseline, understanding our strengths and weaknesses, and then customizing the L&D plan to basically fix those gaps. Hmm. We do have a few customers now really exciting for us that are actually saying, well, yeah, any person we recruit now, we're going to put them through a short data literacy quiz. Hmm. Um, so that's really exciting for us. And I think I can see that's where the market's going to go just because there is this understanding that everyone's job is now involving data and everyone has to really be able to at least do some basic analysis. Yeah. Yeah. And what are the tools that you um, are seeing mostly uh, people using out there for that, for that, um, you know, to, to implement that more data literate culture? Um, in terms of tools, as in like in terms of softwares or in terms of yeah. approaches? Yeah. Like, is it Power BI? Is it Excel? Is it Tableau? Is it um, Looker or... Oh, sure. Yeah, there's a variety and it varies um, depending on the industry. So we would tend to find that enterprises would be more likely to use, let's say, a Power BI because they're used to Microsoft applications. Um, tech companies would be more likely to use a, a um, Looker. And then, you know, companies that are kind of in between might be on more of a Tableau. Um, it really yeah, it depends on on what they're used to in their, their kind of stack. Right. But you're, you're, you're more sort of technology agnostic, would you say? Exactly. Yeah. So we're really about um, focusing on those core capabilities, I guess you'd put it, um, core competencies that are agnostic to any tool. So for example, you know, we would help evaluate someone's ability to understand relational databases as opposed to SQL Server or MySQL and visualization skills as opposed to Tableau or Power BI. Right. Yeah, it's really fascinating. One of the one of the things that I I one hundred percent agree with you, with your insights um, on is um, firms needing to become more data literate, just in general. Um, you know the sort of what you know the white collar jobs is, is, is sort of the term for so like office jobs, right? It yeah, everything is becoming sort of more more data related. Like every sort of SaaS software you you log into, um, you know even. Um, in like uh, PowerPoint presentations and, and things like that, like it, it's all about data. It's all it's all about presenting yep. data. It's all about consuming data, acting on um, acting on data. But one of the one of the things that I think is hard for most um, individuals, but also you know organizational wide, is like what is data literacy? Like what are the key things that are going to make a company more data literate? What are the specific aspects of data that are going to help with that? So I'm interested to know. You know, you seem to be far more focused in that area than, than we've ever been because we've been focused on the sort of the true analyst, the developer um, in enterprise DNA. You know, what are your insights there? Like, how do you actually move the needle on data literacy to really improve that internally? Yeah, that's well, a great question. And I think um, you've touched on something really important, which is that I'd say the term data literacy is actually quite vague and there is not really a unified definition yet in the market. So, um, it really depends on who you speak to as to what data literacy is. Um, mm. I kind of view it as that basic foundational skill set that almost anyone needs. I think you, know, you can compare it to literacy or numeracy in that sense. Like we don't all have to know advanced calculus, but we should know how to count and add up and divide and subtract. And I think data literacy is the equivalent thing. Um, so to give some tangible examples, you know, you would understand maybe like what an outlier is. You'd understand generally what a distribution is. You might understand, okay, in this situation, I should use a median rather than a mean to characterize this data set. Um, you can look at visualizations and interpret them correctly and not make false conclusions. You'd understand like why sample size matters. You know, so give you a good, good example. If you look at a report and you're saying, oh, you know, the number of bookings in uh, South Africa have gone up by 50% last week. You would know to look at it and go, actually, it's gone from two to three. Maybe that's not the most important 50% increase. You know what I mean? Like having that kind of data common sense, I guess you could put it. Um, I think it's really important for pretty much anyone in any role to be able to do those types of things. And then the way we see most companies look at it is uh, basically depending on the type of role you're in, there'd be different expectations. So obviously, if you're a data scientist, you would have a lot higher expectations and need a lot stronger skills in data literacy than if you were an accountant or a, you know, operations manager or, or what have you. So it is really about, I guess, figuring out what you need in each role and then um, putting in place the learning and development plans to try to 
get you up to speed for your particular role. Right. And have you over time developed like a set of questions that you feel can truly assess wherever someone is on their requirements, their data literacy requirements, um, and then you pull from those that question bank, if you like, uh, and then set up the the, the, the assessments for, for those specific seg- segments within businesses? Yeah, exactly. So we basically have a question bank of more than 3,000 questions covering all different skills in analytics, some of which are more what you'd call data literacy. Others are kind of more advanced topics like machine learning and natural language processing and whatnot. But Mm -hmm. uh, some are in that kind of basic core data literacy set. And yeah, the way it would normally work is for a business, we would put together a series of tests or tests to cover these different kind of levels of data literacy that they have, um, that they're expecting their different roles to have. Mm. And uh, we have all this great historical data as well, as you can imagine, after we've had thousands and thousands of people take different different questions on our platform, mm. we can then be in a really good position to then benchmark any new people against the set of previous people that we've assessed. And that's broken down by things like industry, location, role type, all those kinds of things. And have you, have you been able to measure like a tangible outcome from, from walking through um, users or, or individuals through these these sort of sort of different segments within a business uh, around data literacy have you been able to measure that and sort of say okay yep from here we had a we were this data literate uh, to here now we can say we're this you know we're, we're at this sort of level of data literacy yeah we're working on something holistically one um very concrete data point we have though is now the companies who have undergone this internal data literacy assessment and are now being able to place some data analyst roles from people who they previously wouldn't have thought of as data analysts. So people are making the transition from, let's say, you know, someone who might use Excel now and then, like an accounting kind of role, and now being upskilled and placed into this data analyst role. Mm-hmm. So from that, we can calculate then the savings of recruitment spend. So they now don't have to go out and source new external uh, hires for these roles. So that, I think, has actually been one of the most tangible benefits which we're starting to see. That's super exciting because that has a very easily quantifiable um, number to it. Yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, because there, there probably is people don't there's there's the capability to grow that internal data capability, isn't there? Um, rather than exactly. having to always always look outside. And so so that is that a is that has that always been something you thought you could do? Or is that just evolved over time as you've um, as you've just been solving salute, uh, solving things for businesses or your customers? Yeah. That's one that's just kind of emerged organically, and it's really exciting because for these people, it's it's like the it's like the triple win. Basically, you're an internal person, you get a promotion into a new exciting role, you get a pay rise. The company doesn't have to source someone externally. You don't have to go through that pain of hiring someone, and then you give someone more career growth within the business. They're more likely to stay. They're more engaged. They're happy. Um, so it's like yeah, one of those quadruple wins, which is really really exciting. Yeah, nice, nice. And how how is the um how has the the company and the vision evolved over time? Um, was was where you are now exactly where you thought you'd be? You know, three years ago when you started things was a was it a smaller target initially? Like, how, I'm I'm really I'm really fascinated to because this is a this is a space which I know yeah we know that that is just getting bigger and bigger, more relevant, more yep. relevant. So I'm so I'm wondering how how you have evolved into it and how you, the business has evolved over over the last few years. Yeah, so definitely evolved um when we first started we had much more of a focus on the hiring problem so that kind of first problem i spoke about is like hey we've got all these applicants who are the ones we should assess of course once you start and get going you get all this actual feedback so instead of the ideas you have in your head you get actual customers and actual users telling you what's working and telling you what isn't working so we've evolved as a result of that our vision now is very clear it's try to create a world where everyone can get the job they deserve I think that covers both the internal assessments, external assessments, as well as everything we would do into the future in really trying to make everything to do with getting a job as fair and objective as possible. Hmm. So I don't know if you've seen the the Moneyball movie um, for America with Brad Pitt. Um, we're basically trying to do the same thing, but for for people and jobs. It's try to make, you know, get rid of all that gut feel nonsense, all this kind of stuff that's been used for for hiring decisions in the past, and just replace it with cold hard facts rational decisions collecting the right data to making the right decisions interesting so you're actually evolving to not just data related roles but basically any role 
we would eventually go beyond the data space. So we are focused still, I'd say, for at least the next couple of years on, on data roles just because it's it's a big enough challenge to solve. And I think our platform is going to have to be specific to those roles and it's going to have to solve it first there. If we can successfully do that, then, yeah, it would make sense to naturally go um, horizontally into other verticals as well. Interesting. And I was I was um, doing doing a bit of research before we um, we jumped online. You've you've got a you've got a few different offerings, like a you know sort of different products um, as, as how you've listed them. So yeah. how um, how have you broken those down, and and sort of what do they um, all do specifically? Yeah. So basically, they're broken down by the different use cases. So we have what we call Uluba Assess, and this is the product which companies use to assess their data professionals as part of a hiring process. Um, so you'd either, let's say you're hiring a data analyst, data scientist, you'd either assess every applicant who applies for the role with some kind of quick screening quiz. And the other place that customers use that is, is a bit further down the funnel as a slightly more lengthy assessment, perhaps at the same point as which you're interviewing the candidate. So that's what we call a Luber Assess. We have a Luber Junior, which is growing now, which is exciting. And this is companies using usually like a data literacy quiz for their graduate and interns especially those businesses that get really, really high volumes of candidates, like tens of thousands or even sometimes hundreds of thousands of candidates applying. They need some kind of simple, quick way to assess skills um, for data literacy, especially as they realize that um, they really need to make sure that the graduates they're hiring now have those skills so that through time, the data literacy of their organization naturally lifts up. That's what we call a loop of junior. And then a loop of growth is all about assessing internal teams and people. And again, that's uh, most often for data literacy, and that's most often across an organization. So we have done some engagements with specific data teams, but usually businesses are interested in something more holistic and looking at data literacy across the organization. Nice. When I was um, when I was a graduate, um, and um, almost um, what is it, seventeen years ago, um, or, or, or so. Um, it was all about psychometric testing. Is that does, is, is are you are you competing with that, or are you are you finding you're replacing that? Like people actually want you know, instead of some, you know, just um, ideas about someone's personality, they're actually what what yes. more tangible things. Yeah, um, it's yeah, psychometrics interesting. So I've actually done a bit of work in that uh, in the past myself. Funnily enough, as a grad, probably at the same time as yourself, I faced a lot of those IQ tests, which I hated. And I found them painfully annoying. So I created a whole bunch of practice tests to kind of gain that. And yes. yeah, that's one of the things about IQ tests is you can just actually practice and get better. So they're probably not perfectly covered. Mm -hmm. um, most often for companies, when we speak to them for hiring, actually, they don't have an existing test. They're not replacing necessarily a personality quiz or an IQ test. It's more often than not, they're currently doing things manually. So it's like they're just reviewing lots of CVs. They're probably interviewing more candidates than what they would need to. They're doing a manual take-home assessment. So we don't tend to replace an existing test, at least on the, the hiring front anyway. Right. One, uh, one of the other things that, that comes to mind is I'm sure there's a lot of, uh, of our listeners, a um, lot, lot, lot who are sort of learning probably Power BI specifically, but probably want to know, okay, well, what are – some of the things or what are some of the learning paths that they can go through to know that they can uh, very competently um, take these assessments that you are creating for businesses? Um, and, you know, is there, is there specific things that they can learn for, you know, go, go through for data science or particular technologies or just data literacy? Like what are the things that you think they should be focused on to be able to be a really good candidate um, that could work through your um, assessments? Yeah, good question. So, um, I mean, our assessments are quite practical in general, so they're not necessarily that theoretical. So the more practical ex hands-on experience you have in doing whatever it is, machine learning, Power BI, Tableau, et cetera, the better off you're going to be. Um, so that's the, the first thing to say. Second thing would be we now have an increasing number of pra free practice tests on our website, which so we just launched another, I think, seven or eight last week, and we'll continue to add more. And we are trying to build out what we call a Luba world. So this is like our free offering to the candidate community, uh, starting off with some free tests. But we do have a vision to try to make that a lot more um, all-encompassing and trying to give candidates uh, feedback, ways to prepare better for interviews, um, a lot more content. So that's definitely on the roadmap for, for the rest of the year. 
do you think that you could almost become like a bit of a pipeline um, of candidates for this business, like actually provide the training in um, you know, particular technologies? Is that, is, that, is that possibly a vision for the future? Um, maybe the training. Um, I think more likely we could end up being a marketplace for candidates. So at least in the identification and like qualification of skilled candidates and connecting those to businesses, like I can imagine us doing that. The training, I feel like there's probably other businesses that are better off uh, and are going to be better than us at doing that for, for quite a while. Right. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big, uh, a big, big, uh, big task because there is a lot of competitors out there for sure, for sure. Us being one of them, I think, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> um, what, what, do you, what is your general view about um, sort of the Seeks of this world or the, um, the other online platforms? They seem to have um, gained a lot of traction initially and everyone thought that it would sort of really democratise the, um, the hiring process and the ability of the candidates to, to apply for jobs. But it seems like it's probably morphed into something um, you know, much worse. It's, 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 it's gone too far. Um, it's just made the whole process you know, totally inefficient. What, what's your sort of take on on how that has a, how that's evolved over time, and and how um, you know how how, how to you know, improve the whole ex- the whole experience? I mean, I know you are you are basically solving that, but um, I presume people still are using those online platforms. So so how how do how does how do people like really move away from that? How do, how do they how do they truly improve that entire experience? Yeah, good question. So I think. Maybe there's two sides to the marketplace. There's what I'd suggest for candidates and what I'd suggest for businesses. For candidates, I think you have to play the game. Like even if the game is stupid or the rules are dumb, it doesn't matter. You kind of have to play it. Um, so as a candidate, generally, I'd recommend um, you know using your contacts and networks as best you can. So if you can circumvent the typical hiring process where you're just a CV in a pool of 100 other CVs, then obviously you should do that. Um, that's maybe not the fairest way of hiring, but um, you know, that is what I would do if I were a candidate and I wanted an advantage. I would try to f- find a way to get my foot in the door through whatever means possible. Um, now, for businesses, though, yeah, the hiring process is a real mess, and I think it's going to change radically in the next 10 years. From my view, like I started working 11 years ago, I don't think online job boards have really changed that much at all. It's still just, you know, Here's an application form. Here's a CV. I'm going to do that 100 times. Someone's going to look at my CV for maybe five seconds if I'm lucky or not look at it at all and make some arbitrary decision on whether or not they're going to interview me. Like that's a typical hiring process of 99% of businesses. And that's yeah. deeply flawed. So I think, yeah, there's a lot of problems. But holistically, the way I see it working is that we need to automate away very manual time-consuming things, which means businesses can't actually focus enough effort on a set of candidates in any meaningful way. Um, We need to collect the right data to make the right decisions. So I think a CV is a really weak data set to make a decision. Um, You know, to your point at the top of the call, you know, people getting excluded because they've got the wrong font or had a few spelling errors or whatever. Like those types of things are just such weak predictors of whether or not someone's going to be the right person at the job, which is ultimately what you're trying to decide. So mm-hmm. replacing those types of things with something more um, more accurate data and being able to make better decisions. For example, assessing their skills in an objective way and saying, okay, well, here you go. This person's a match for 90% of the skills we need. On the basis of that, we think we should interview them. We think we should hire them. Yeah. So that's where I see it going. Likewise, for interviews, actually, like when we – interview people and when we um, discuss this with customers I can see interviews are typically done in quite an ad hoc unstructured way where it's every kind of man woman dog and child for their own in terms of what questions they ask and what they're trying to evaluate and how subjective it is you know even interviews I've sat in sat in on where I've interviewed someone along with someone else we get to the end of the interview and we have complete disagreement over how the candidate performed on each of the questions Mm. Clearly, that means there's some subjectivity that we need to remove. So trying to make even the interview process as objective as possible, again, through collecting the right data and making it as structured as possible, that's basically where I see hiring going over the next few years. Mm. Do you ever feel like your platform would be a perfect candidate for integration into, say, a Seek or into like even LinkedIn? Like LinkedIn is sort of like the biggest global marketplace for um, finding and sort you know, and, and candidates seeking out um, roles, et cetera. Have you ever 
is that is that some a consideration is that is that something that could be on the roadmap yeah maybe one day i think they're relatively ginormous compared to us so i'd rather deal with that in a few years if we're in a better position to um to defend ourselves um, yeah. at the moment i think yeah, i'd rather keep our intellectual property away from those guys at the moment yeah well maybe 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 it would be an acquisition rather than a, rather right. than a partnership. um maybe that would be a bit a, a more sensible option um but how you know in, in saying that because you know one of, i guess one of the big things that they have is they've got distribution right they've got they've got eyeballs they've got people already coming to their site and and yeah. we probably both both realize that you know getting that getting that attention um online these days is, is hard it's, it's expensive in a lot of cases so how how have you found doing that with your own brand um, how are you doing it now? How have, how have things um, evolved, um, uh, you know, through custom, you know, for customer acquisition um, over time? Yeah, so we've basically spent the last few years trying to iterate through numerous lead generation strategies, a lot of which don't work, some of which do work. Um, so at least we've got a few channels which are working reasonably well for us. LinkedIn actually is one of them. Um, as you can imagine, like, you know, we can target pretty specifically who we're interested in speaking to and do direct outreach to them, basically. Mm -hmm. um, and then leveraging the power of our network as well has worked really well. So basically getting warm introductions to people that we know. Um, the other segment, which is appearing nicely now and is a good sign, is that customers would organically introduce us to other customers. Or when we have a customer and they leave the business and go somewhere else, they would kind of re-engage with us. Mm -hmm. um, so that is really the point that we have to get to where it's just happening kind of automatically behind the scenes through word of mouth mm. for us to get there we have to really double down and absolutely nail the product and just continue to solve solve it and make it as as amazing as it as it should be cool cool and how's your journey been as uh as, as an entrepreneur and um you know having to fund your own well i'm not sure are you uh, are you are you bootstrapping are you funded you know how how's that how's that journey been yeah it's been uh I'd say, what do I like to call it? The good, the bad, and the ugly. Every single day is like that. <laughs> uh, yeah, started out bootstrapping, um, and then we were fortunate enough to raise seed capital a couple of years ago, um, which is great, from some local uh, angel investors in Sydney. So that's mm -hmm. fantastic. Um, so we're on that round at the moment. And yeah, it's been tough, but interesting, exciting, never a dull moment. Mm -hmm. um, uh very challenging. I mean, anything that could go wrong will go wrong. Uh, <laughs> but then you get these kind of glimmers of real optimism and you know, each day the kind of the mix just slightly changes. So there's just a bit less shit, a bit more good stuff. And you just keep hacking away at it day after day and eventually you get somewhere. It's kind of kind of amazing. <laughs> it's it's uh yeah it's, it's i i i'm 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 laughing i'm i'm having a having a laugh um because it's it's an it's an emotional roller coaster isn't it it is yeah it sure is what what have you found the most challenging uh, say for example sales or product development or um product market fit like what are, what are what are the things that you've you've really found most challenging um two that spring to mind are people and sales so people in terms of like as in hiring our own people defining like who we wanted to be what the type of people we want to hire where they should be um how we wanted to work together and just iterating through that so that has been a massive challenge probably a lot bigger than what i ever thought it would have been starting out got, and then i'd a, say there's a, there's a bit of irony there exactly exactly there's a massive <laughs> amount of irony um which is not lost on me at all <laughs> yeah um Yes, exactly. And then the sales piece, especially I'd say enterprise sales. So like before this, I was an analyst and managing an analytics team. So I did not know the slightest thing about enterprise sales. So that has been an absolute schooling for me, especially I think the first year. I, think I get the hang of it now. But just dealing with yeah the mm -hmm. amount of different stakeholders that be involved in selling to an enterprise, the amount of different steps, how slow it can be, how bureaucratic it can be. Um, and just finding a way to navigate through all that red tape. I guess that would be the other big challenge. That, that is so true. That is so true. That was one of my biggest realizations as well. When we 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 used to always be B to we were B to C to start off with, particularly with our education platform. And as soon as we tried to go B to B, 
some of these conversations took six months, sometimes yeah, yeah. longer. And you're on the you're you're on the call, you're on you know fifteen to twenty calls, and you still haven't even booked any revenue. It's it's quite unbelievable. Yeah. Um, and and the realization was like you need it. You need to have a mix. Like that was our realization is you got to have a mix or. Right. You just you just die on on um you know just just you, you run out of cash just trying to make just trying to make the odd sale um yeah so it's yeah that, that's that's really interesting to hear it from um from your end as well but because it's exactly the same thing um from, yeah. from what we we, we learned and um have discovered over time and still and still learning to be honest like it's, it, it doesn't it doesn't end every everything no, is every business um has its its own uh, layers of bureaucracy that you just you have no idea about until you actually start talking to someone yeah, the other big thing is um, for us dealing with like no feedback. That's actually been one of the biggest challenges: is how to interpret no feedback, like null feedback or ghosting, or just someone not getting back, not getting back to you, um, as opposed to hey, like yeah, you know, uh, we're not going to go ahead now because of X, Y, Z reasons. That's like quite mm-hmm. actionable. You can deal with that, but for us, ninety five percent of the time, it's just no answer at all. I'm trying mm-hmm. to figure out okay, what was wrong? Was it the pricing? Was it the product? Was it mm-hmm. our approach? Was it just mm. not the right time for them? Were they not that interested? Mm. Um, and yeah, trying to navigate through that has also been quite quite a challenge. I, I'm, I'm most of your, are you having to do like a lot of education, or um, do you do a lot of your customers come to you and they they already know they've got a problem? They already know they want to fix it. Um, so, I'd say for the most part, they are aware of some of their problems and would need a lot of convincing over others. So, for example. We talk a lot about, hey, you know, you've got the CV screening uh, stage in your process where 99% of candidates get rejected. Have you ever thought about how accurate that might be? Maybe some of those candidates are actually really good candidates, but they're being rejected because of formatting on their CV or maybe something more scurrilous, maybe like their name, you know, some unconscious bias going on, like those types of things. I think yeah, that's been a bigger challenge is trying to convince them of that and then take action to resolve it. I think that's the big difference. So mm-hmm. if it requires some kind of actual change process mm-hmm. as opposed to just slotting into their existing process, that's been the biggest challenge. Um, and if it's a larger enterprise where there's like multiple different types of people who have completely different perspectives and different parts of the process, let's say talent acquisition, hiring managers, individual contributors, procurement, and then getting all of them on board in the same way, I think that is really challenging. Yeah, I can I can only imagine that's far more challenging than some of the things we have. Because I'd also imagine as well as so you're you're really um, you're really coming in and you're trying to change processes in a lot of ways. And sometimes I would yeah. I would imagine that some people see that as a bit of an affront on on what they've been doing in the past. And if they've been doing a good job in the past, and they might they might think if we change this, people will want you know they'll they'll think that we weren't doing anything well before our process um, was no good um, before. So um, I, I have you been running up to some of those those challenges and and, the, and those discussions as well. Yeah, not explicitly, but I imagine behind the scenes or implicitly we have been. Um, but yeah, it, it's really demonstrated as that kind of protectionist type of view or like, oh, well, you know, is this going to expose me? Um, I imagine we have behind the scenes, but not not explicitly. Right. Interesting. Interesting. What do you, do you ever, um, you know, just getting back to data literacy, I'm, 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 I've become more a... Um, a um, a fan of of this entire data literacy concept in the last twelve months or so. Just seeing um, our, um, p- you know, particularly Power BI because that's our focus. Of really seeing um, the growth of it in, in a lot of organisations and and realizing that there's been a huge need from the consumer base to just just understand how to interpret reports that the developers are are developing, etc. Do you find that most businesses are pretty upfront and they and they and they're like. You know, we're not data literate enough. Like, are they, are they happy to admit that? Um, are they happy to realize, okay, we need some improvement here? Uh, you know, what what's what sort of your take on that? Yeah, they are. Um, maybe our sample's a bit biased because if we've engaged with them almost by definition, they have that realization already because then it's part of their strategy and that's at the point at which they're looking for a measurement tool to measure their data literacy. So, yeah, it's, it's probably quite a biased sample. Um, yep. Now... I think there's quite a big difference between realizing that holistically at an organization, oh, we need better data literacy versus at an individual level. Hmm. Um, And so that's an interesting data point we actually collect as part of our testing process, which is before someone takes a quiz, 
they self-rate, like they rate themselves on a scale of one to 10 for each of the skills we assess them in. Mm -hmm. And to cut a long story short, from three years of data, we found that people on average drastically overestimate their skills. Um, and this is independent actually of gender or anything else like that. They overestimate by the same amount. So what we tend to find is people are yeah, quite happy to admit that organizationally they need some improvements, but at an individual level, maybe not as open to that feedback. <laughs> right. Interesting. Interesting. Um Oh, that's no different to sort of like the car. Everyone, everyone thinks they're a better driver than they are as well. Exactly. Um, yeah. And what what are some like uh, customer success stories you can you can mention? Like, have you where where can you definitively say that you have sort of transformed the hiring process? You've transformed the the data literacy of an organization. What a yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm I, I guess over three years you've probably got some examples, but yeah, keen to keen. To, Keen to know a little bit more about for it. sure. So one that's public and we can discuss. Actually, there's a video on our homepage about it. So it's a business in England called Kazoo, hyper growth tech company, founded yeah. three years ago, basically like an online cars marketplace. So imagine being able to buy and sell cars online that mm -hmm. need to go physically to a marketplace. Mm -hmm. um, they, as you can imagine, had a really good time during COVID because all the car uh, yards were shut. Um, yet everyone had ex extra disposable income and wanted to have that kind of luxury per purchase. So they did really well. They went from founded to IPO'd in three years for $7 billion, like crazy hyper growth. Oh, as yeah. part of that, as you can imagine, they need to hire a lot of data people um, mm. growing at that, at that rate and having that many users. Um, mm. So initially they were doing the typical kind of hiring process. That is, you, know, you put up these job ads, you read all these CVs, and for them, that was a lot because they're quite a hot brand in England. So they're getting a lot of applications mm. and they just literally didn't even have enough people to read through them and assess them properly. So the hiring process was slowing down. Um, and they're also quite aware of their own potential biases in especially that CV screen. So mm. they replaced all of that with an Aluba quiz. So for each different role in analytics they have, they basically have a customized Aluba assessment, be it for a product analyst, a data analyst, a data scientist. And the first step of every uh, one of those processes is for the candidates to take this quick kind of skills quiz. And on the basis of that, they decide who to interview and the rest of the process goes on. Mm -hmm. So what they reported to us is basically, obviously, a lot of cost and time saving because they're not spending all that time reading all those CVs. Uh, the time to hire improved, again, because they weren't burdened by having to have someone sit there and manually review CVs and it was only once it had been reviewed that they could go to the next stage of the pipeline. So that was all automated away. And they did report improved diversity in their team, um, potentially as a result of then having this, you know, just completely independent objective measure that is anonymized completely and doesn't consider anything to do with the person. It's just purely about whether or not um, they had those skills. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, that's really, really, really um, interesting. And um and like, what what are the, what are what are some of the numbers like that they were sort of dealing with that you were you were helping to refine? Um, are we talking like hundreds of candidates that they you know from their initial uh, part, uh, lead lead gen and then you know filtering those down to to you know ten or or, or the, the, around that sort of percentage? Yeah, so they hire at pretty large scales, so they would have had you know a few thousand applicants in a year across those roles. Um, yeah, and so they basically. The way they do it is they would, um, it's the way most customers use the product is they funnel everyone through that quiz and then just rank order based on their score. And uh, we have a feature which we call candidate cloaking. So they have that switched on. So basically you wouldn't even see the details of the candidate at all. You just see their score and their breakdown for each skill. And you basically click on them and say, okay, yep, I want to interview this person now. Now I reveal who they are. So trying to really as best as we possibly can remove as much of that uh, potential for bias um, by just focusing purely on that person's score, making the decision, yes, I'm going to interview them, and then figuring out their details and saying, yeah, okay, here's who they are. Let's interview them now. Um, mm. So in terms of placements, I think they've hired, I think, 30-ish people over the last year into their different data teams mm. and assess, yeah, like 100 times that. Interesting. Have you got any other unique insights just from the, the data which you're collecting over um, who's who, who are um, more leaning towards this sort of job role, like um, between males and females, or um, you know the different um, different segments of, a, of 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 the population? What what are some other unique uh, insights that you've been able to gather? 
Yep. So definitely analytics is male dominated, um, not as much as engineering. So we use our own product also to hire our own engineers. So for us, we get 95% of applicants a male for software engineering roles, whereas mm-hmm. for analytics, it's more like a 75-25 split. So still male dominated, but um, not as male dominated as software engineering. Um, mm-hmm. It tends to get a bit, seems to be the pattern is the, the roles that are a bit more kind of customer facing, quote unquote, tend to be a little bit less male dominated. Mm-hmm. Um, so we find, for example, the product analysts are a bit more balanced compared to, let's say, the um, data engineers, a bit more kind of behind the scenes. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, but, but otherwise still, yeah, a, a fair way to go on the old uh, gender balance in, in analytics, I'd say. Yeah, no. Yeah, that's it's, it's totally totally what we see as well through through the numbers in our in our platform as well. We'd love to um, be able to get more more females into into the space. Um, what what do you think? What do you think it will take to to do that? That's a good question. Um, in in some sense, I like for businesses. Um, you know. If you're looking at like targets and those kinds of things, I would be very cognizant of just the the set of candidates that are available. So I'd just be quite aware of the fact that like you know, let's say 75% of all candidates are going to be men. So I'd be careful of having like 50-50 kind of targets and those types of things. Um, in terms of attracting more women into the industry, I I don't know. I don't know, honestly. I think the more representation there is, so maybe the more female leaders there are in analytics, the more demonstrable female leaders. That's got to help for sure, because mm. um, there's more visibility over how their career paths could advance to, you know, let's say a chief data scientist or a head of data analytics kind of role. So that presumably would help. And the reading I've done on this suggests representation is really important. Mm-hmm. Other than that, I'm I'm not too sure. Mm. Yeah, no, that's, I think that's fair enough. How many um how many team uh, in your team, Tim? We are eight eight of us, um, remote first, so we're spread throughout. Uh, eight different cities in the world, which uh, mm-hmm. makes some things good and some things very challenging. Um, and that's actually part of our own philosophy is that we use our own product to do our own hiring, as you can imagine. And we place job ads in every corner of the globe and we just funnel people through a quiz and on the basis of their performance, we're going to interview them. I don't care where they are in the world, who they are, their age, their anything. Um, and that's, I think, our secret source at the moment is we're able to identify the types of candidates a lot of other companies will be missing because they're overly focused on a CV and what someone's done in the past as opposed to what their current skills are. Mm. What do you what do you think uh, are the numbers that you need to to, to be able to um, evolve into your, your wider vision um, of um, maybe maybe being sort of the platform for all all hiring? Numbers in terms of just internal person, like internal personnel. Do you think you can do it with with what you've currently got, or do you think? Oh, okay. Yeah. Like- um, I think our current team can get us to product market fit, and my reading of this has, has suggested that actually having quite a small team makes it easier to get to product market fit than having a bigger team. So I think we're probably at the right scale now for where we're at, mm-hmm. and then um, hopefully if things evolve. We get into that kind of scale up phase, which we're approaching now then it'll be a case of maybe raising a Series A round of capital and hiring out a lot mm. more engineers mainly um, and then building out the kind of sales and marketing function as well. Mm. But at the moment, I think, yeah, our, our team's good and we're small enough to be able to iterate through things quickly enough, which I think is really super important. Mm. Interesting. So your 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 plan is to go for the, that next round um, or, or further rounds of funding to, to be able to get to your goals quicker? Yeah, I think so. So. We're at a kind of sustainable point now, so we could just keep going along now, and it's fine. And so we have, we have, um, you know, we're masters of our own destiny, or whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, once we're ready, once we feel like, yeah, okay, we've nailed this product, like this now kind of sells itself, um, and we just want to pour fuel on the fire. Then that's the point at which we would raise uh, venture capital. I'm mm-hmm. hoping that will be sort of towards the end of this year. It's my current, my current thoughts. Oh, that's great. That's really exciting. Really exciting for you guys. And so, yep. as we sort of round round things off, what are is, is there anything else that um, that we haven't covered off that uh, is 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 unique to Aluba and, and unique to your experiences 
um, yeah, I'm, I'm keen for our listeners to really get a good overview and make sure they get as good an overview as possible in terms of like your value prop um, and, and how you feel like you're really sort of changing the game in, in, in the hiring and the L&D space. So is there anything that I maybe haven't touched upon or, um, you know, you could, you could elaborate on further? Yeah, I think we've covered most of it. I'd say for me, the key takeaways of this, if people just thought a little bit about their hiring process and thought a little bit about each of the steps and um, really thought about how fair and how accurate they were. And in particular, I'd suggest thinking about that CV screening step um, and then the interview. So for the CV screening step for, I don't know, 99% of all customers we've ever spoken to, they all use that process. And that's where 95 to 99% of candidates will be rejected. So Mm -hmm. any improvement you make to that step is going to have the biggest improvement possible to your hiring process. Mm-hmm. And really think carefully about like, what are you looking for in that CV? What are you expecting? How valuable do you think a CV is? How insightful is it? Um, and we've got an interesting experiment on our website, the, the results of an experiment we did on, on man, manual CV screening. And uh, that was really interesting. So maybe I could just touch on that briefly. So basically we got uh, this whole pool of CVs, about 500 CVs. Uh, independently got a whole bunch of different recruiters to shortlist the CVs. They all had the same job ad, the same set of CVs, the same parameters. And what was really amusing was that basically they all shortlisted different candidates. It was like a completely random list. Some shortlisted 50, some shortlisted three. Uh, You know, it was like you couldn't have picked it. It was genuinely almost random. And Mm. behind the scenes, we also had all these candidates' uh, skills tests. So we didn't expose those to the recruiters. Um, so what was also fascinating was the best performing candidate in the skills quiz wasn't picked by anyone at all. Um, and of the top 50 performers, only half of them were picked by anyone. Right. So if anything, you would have been better off rand- you would have been better off flipping a coin in terms of who you were choosing from the series. That is that is that that is actual like real world data from something that I think. I think a lot of us, and, and certainly me, intuitively have always thought like, yes. um, but but very hard, always very hard to quantify, right? Um, yeah. But that that's that is so fascinating. That is crazy fascinating. Is there um one of the things that just popped into my mind? Is there a way um like you've got a lot of products now, a lot of ways that you can help um out um, businesses? Is there a, a sort of like a, a first touch? Um, way that they uh, a customer can use your product like do you have sort of like a land and expand strategy or you're kind of like okay um, complete overhaul required here no we definitely try to make it easy to get started so uh, for some companies we uh, often start with just let's say a, a role so okay you're hiring a data analyst or a data science is fine okay let's just use this as a proven concept we can help you assess the skills help you think about the hiring process so it doesn't have to be that all or nothing approach um, we do try to uh, give them some value as quickly as possible, as easily as possible. And that's just like one hiring manager with one role and a handful of candidates, then fine. Likewise for the Aluba Growth piece. So it's just like one hiring manager and, and one team, just like their team of five or six people and just assessing them and getting some insights. And then using that as almost like the proof concept to go out to the rest of the business and say, hey, this thing looks interesting. Could we expand this, and get similar benefits throughout the rest of the company? Cool. Yeah, that makes complete sense. It's a, a really, a really sensible um, way to at least get exposure and, and get people testing it. So yeah, I really, really, really think the strategy is smart. Well, Tim, I don't have too much else. Um, I know that we're sort of um, wrap, wrapping up here. I really, really appreciate your time and insights. It's, it's quite, quite. Um, it's a bunch of unique insights that we haven't really had um, so much on the, on the podcast previously. So, so really, really appreciate um, having you on and, and enjoyed um, getting to know Aluba a lot, a lot better as well. No worries. Thanks for having me, Sam. It's been a real pleasure. Cool. Okay, everyone, just wrapping up uh, this uh, this session. Um, thanks for tuning in and uh, sub- subscribing to the Analytic Mind podcast. Plenty, plenty more great um, uh, sessions uh, to come out in, in the very near future. Thanks again, Tim. Um, I look forward to um, getting this out live and, and getting everyone's feedback. Awesome. Thanks, Sam. Thanks.